Yes, we are um, actually getting ready up here for uh, the arrival of a um, cargo vehicle that is going to bring a, a ton of uh, science um, for us to perform in about uh, four or five uh, weeks uh, that we'll stay there. And in anticipation of that, we are basically trying to make sure that everything is ready and we're really taking care uh, of all the maintenance activities on, on space station because once that vehicle show up, uh, it's going to be a rush to get all that science done and there will be very little time to actually take care of the vehicle so this is what we are doing now yeah Peggy thanks for the for the question I think that what I see uh, compared to seven years ago is that space station is even busier than it was back then. I mean, back then I had the feeling that there was so much going on, but now it's like an order of magnitude more. There are so many more experiments. There is so much more equipment. Uh, you know, if, if you look around me, you see how, you know, the density there are everywhere. There are cables, laptops, uh, and, and that's just a sign of the, uh, all the hardware, all the um, scientific equipment that is attached to all those cables and, and laptops. So I, I think that the uh, space station program and all the international partners, including uh, ESA, have really stepped up their game in, in terms of the sheer quantity and variety of activities that are on space station. And that includes both um, pure scientific research, like, you know, really trying to understand a scientific phenomenon, uh, but also a lot of technology demonstrations because you, we really want to make use of this amazing facility that we have, the International Space Station, to um, develop, mature, test um, technologies that will enable us to explore a space further beyond uh, low Earth orbit. Yeah, thank you, Clive. Um, so, um, well, we are on a 24-hour schedule, just like on the ground. Uh, although, of course, uh, we, we, you know, we don't we don't have this sunrise and sunset rhythm that that we have on Earth, but we basically go by our watches, um, and and we have a pretty um, routine, you know, day where you know we start in the morning around 7:30ish. We start our work day. We have a conference that kind kind of get us all synced up with all the control centers around the world. You know, Houston, Huntsville, Munich. In Europe, to Cuba, Moscow, you know, we talk to all the teams that work with us throughout the day, um, and then we get off to our job, and, you know, we work for about, you know, 12 hours until 7.30 in the evening. That does include and that speaks to your point of you know staying healthy. Uh, about two and a half hours that are dedicated to workouts. Um, you know, in weightlessness, a lot of our muscles really don't have to work much. You know, like you guys on the ground now, you have to like work to you know sit upright or stay upright or to walk. We don't have to do that, and so we really have to work out every day to prevent muscle atrophy, but also bone loss. Um, you know, we we have our meals that we try to take together as much as possible, and then in the evenings uh, we we get a chance to relax my phone calls uh, so we you know we, we try to even up here although we you know this is our home and our workplace we try to maintain a healthy uh, work-life balance Yes, so um, when it comes to the space station, space station is very much an integrated uh, vessel. Uh, and so there is no way to like separate it, its function and its ability to continue to operate, um, you know, from like the, the, you know, separating like the Russian uh, or NASA uh, contributions, so, you know, or, or the other international partners. So you really need uh, this cooperation to continue and stay healthy and stay productive in order to maintain space station and I think we all recognize how important space station is I mean it you know it, it's it's like this I, I like to call it humanity's outpost in space now of course there's also a Chinese space station uh, for a long time there was really only ISS um, and uh, it, it's incredible incredibly valuable uh, because it's an incredibly unique and capable facility you know we're not gonna have something exactly like space station for a long time to come and so we all recognize that uh, yes it's a time of conflict yes we are devastated by what is happening you know on earth but we also know that we have something precious that we need to protect and preserve and so we focus on that both on the professional 
level and you know all the interactions that all the themes uh, all the teams that the support space station have uh, between agencies and certainly up here in space where we are one crew and uh, and, and you know and we focus on on our friendship and on our shared commitment to space station Yes, for sure this is a um, is something that gets constantly monitored. Uh, there are assets uh, on the ground of uh, situational awareness where um, debris that uh, might come into collision with space station is tracked and, if, and, and we're very conservative. If there is even a remote chance that such a piece of debris uh, will hit space station, uh, the ground controllers will work together. Again, you know, Houston and Moscow will work together to plan an avoidance maneuver. And so what happens here on space station, we're usually told, hey guys, you know, we're tracking a conjunction, that's how they're called, and, you know, and, 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 and as we get closer to the time where this conjunction might happen, they will decide, okay, it's clearing up, or, well, we do have to move space station out of the way, and then they will turn on the engines, and we will gently move uh, to a slightly higher or lower orbit um, to get out of the way. But in general, uh, it is indeed uh, a serious problem. I mean, the, the you know the orbits around the earth you, you have to they're almost like a natural resource right that, that that is available out there and you have to preserve for use for you know future uh, generations as well uh, and so I kind of like to compare it to um, uh, aeronautical flight, right? I think somewhere in the, 19, in the 1940s, so mid of the last century, uh, it was recognized that traffic was going to increase more and more, and so countries came together and developed rules of, you know, air traffic management rules so that we can all, you know, have millions of people flying every day safely around the world. And so for space, it, it, it's kind of like the same thing. So I know that there is an interagency debris coordination committee that uh, provides guidelines uh, for um, agencies and, and private actors to, to follow and, and certainly that, that is valuable. Um, technology is, you know, part of the solution is going to reside in technology. Um, I know ESA has in, um, an initiative for a demonstrator um, that is going to fly, um, it was like uh, you know, purchased, let's say, by, by ESA as a service contract from a uh, Swiss um, uh, company, I believe, and that will demonstrate the ability to uh, launch a device that will be able to dock to a piece of debris that's been on orbit for almost a decade and safely deorbit, like deorbit it, bringing it back to Earth. So. Part of the solution is regulatory, you know, let, let's all uh, plan our, our satellites and the operations of our satellites so that, you know, they do not like stay in orbit, they do not uh, explode, they do not collide, so they do not pose a threat. And then we need to clean up uh, the debris that is already out there and, and that definitely has a, a technological solution to it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's there's two aspects to it. I mean, I, I think that there's going to be a, um, a smooth uh, uh, transition uh, in low Earth orbit to uh, private actors. Uh, there's some uh, uh, U.S. companies that are definitely leading the way there, uh, but uh, hopefully there will also be more and more European actors who want to step in, in, in that um, um, uh, area of, uh, of creating, you know, space stations or platforms for research in, uh, in microgravity in low Earth orbit. And those are going to be the success successors of uh, the ISS. And then we have to look beyond that. And so uh, going back to the moon, you know, first to cislunar space and then on the surface of the moon with obviously the long-term goal of uh, eventually getting to, um, to Mars. And so um, ESA, is, uh, the European Space Agency, is very much a, a part of that. Uh, ESA provides the service module for the Orion spacecraft that is going to bring astronauts to um, lunar orbit. Um, and so that, that is a, um, a complex uh, and, and quite significant piece of hardware that um, ESA has developed involving seven uh, countries across uh, Europe. Uh, there is Gateway. Gateway is uh, uh, going to be a space station, uh, smaller than ISS, but 
much, much further out uh, in orbit around uh, the moon. And uh, ESA is providing the international, so-called international habitat, so basically the main um, habitation module as well as other uh, components. So this uh, international cooperation is definitely continuing. Uh, it's one of the great legacies, I think, of, uh, of Space Station that, you know, we, we showed that that works and, and it's productive and, uh, um, and it helps uh, um, protect and preserve such uh, long-term uh, programs uh, um, over the years that are necessary for uh, such complex uh, developments. Yeah, I, I think that the impact of mega constellations is certainly something that needs to be uh, managed, and uh, um, you know, it goes a little bit back to what I mentioned earlier about the necessity of uh, managing the, uh, uh, the the orbits, kind of like on the ground we manage the um, the airspace. Um, but of course, they are also a, a source of uh, potential for you know economic growth and and benefits for uh, for society. And so um, you know everything always brings potential benefits and then potential risks. That that need to be uh, managed, um, but in general, I think it's uh, it's very exciting that there is so much interest in uh, in the private sector. And in fact, uh, I uh, um, you know I, I I hope and I'm very hopeful that there will be uh, more and more in investment in uh, in the sector because I think that. Um, liberates uh, ideas and uh, potential business opportunities and. Um, uh, potential for innovation, uh, potential for driving down the costs uh, of access to space, of operating in space, so that again more and more actors can enter uh, this sector and participate with uh, you know n new ideas, new products, new services. So I think it's a virtuous cycle uh, that I believe has started already, and uh, um, I'm hopeful that it will continue to accelerate. Yeah, I, I I do have a little bit of a more positive view. I uh, I have to say, um, uh, you know, in in my Dragon Crew, my um, uh, you know the, the vehicle that uh, I came up with, uh, uh, it was four of us, and it was two of us were uh, were women, so um, 50 percent. Uh, the NASA astronaut core is incredibly diverse. Um, at the European Space Agency, uh, we have not had a selection for over a decade, so um, we haven't had time to like you know update. Our, our composition and, and, and catch up a little bit also with the development of society. Um, but we have a selection that is ongoing now. And from the number of female candidates and the quality of applications that we have received, we, uh, we know that there is going to be um, a lot more women in the European Astronaut Corps as well. Uh, of course, uh, you know, as, as an astronaut, it's, uh, it's, it's my duty and my privilege to uh, reach out, especially to young people, and try to um, make them excited about a space and, and STEM in general, and and um, and of course, uh, hopefully, also more and more uh, women will uh, consider that um, that career path and and become you know future colleagues of ours in in a capacity or another. Um, but but at the same time, I'm I'm quite uh, I'm quite happy about uh, the current uh, trend. Absolutely. Thank you all. It was such a pleasure. Thank you for uh, coming to visit us on Space Station.